Hey, fellow Mathers, before we get into this episode, we want to share with you how you can get access to free content, professional learning that will keep your students engaged and doing the math that matters. Get ready to go to this link, mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. That's right. Registration is open for the free Math is Figure Outable challenge that's starting May 15th and runs to the 17th at 7 p.m. Central. We're going to have three nights jam-packed with learning and routines that you can take straight to your classroom. In these challenges, we have a great time. We do some math, talk about classroom experiences, give away super cool bonuses and prizes. You won't just walk away with routines that are naturally engaging and encourage your students to think mathematically. You'll also have a chance to win over 6 k worth in prizes, including a few virtual PD sessions for your school. I'll be joined by my wonderful co-host, Kim, and special guest, Jenna Laib. You can register at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge for a fantastic learning experience. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Now on to the show. Hey, fellow mathematicians. Welcome to the podcast where math is figureoutable. I'm Pam. And I'm Kim. And you're in a place where math is not about memorizing and mimicking, where you're waiting to be told or shown what to do, but we believe it's about making sense of problems, noticing patterns, and reasoning using mathematical relationships. Because we can mentor students to think and reason like mathematicians. Not only are algorithms not particularly helpful in teaching mathematics, but when we just have students rotely repeat steps, that can keep them from being the mathematicians they can be. Hello. Hey, Kim. What's up? I feel like the last three weeks we've been talking about how busy we are. Because <laughs> we great. are jamming out those problems. I know. Books. And Woo! some of the things. Like, I'm loving it. I'm loving what we're doing. It's okay, so, so I grabbed a review for us today. But I got to tell you, oh. um, uh, Stephen, the Wildcat professor, mm. Wildcat prof, uh, thank you for uh, putting your name at the end because the – the name that <laughs> W116SCH, I want to know what that is or if it's just like a auto-generated. Anyway, right, 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 right. right. Steven says, this is a must for elementary math teachers. I agree. With experience as an administrator, coordinator, and now back in the classroom, that's fun. Oh, this yeah. podcast has taught me more than I've ever learned in my college math methods, methods course. Yes, one course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. Well done, ladies. Well, thanks for that. I, thanks, Wildcat wild cat Prof. Thanks for that. Nice. You know, sometimes I think back on my uh, classes, and I actually don't think that my one math class was bad. Like, I think we had a great textbook, and we did some really cool things. Uh, of course, not what's happening here. But I am uh, a little jealous for your students, your college students. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, my math methods course is pretty good. I mean, that's pretty fantastic. I'm so excited for those people who are leaving uh, college with uh, kind of a new... It is uh, so much fun to go to conferences Mm -hmm. and have um, an adult come up to me and say, I was in your university math methods course and this is what I've done with it. And it's just amazing. That's Uh, fun. It's really cool. Really cool. Well, thanks, Stephen. Yeah, cool. Hey, and Kim, one of my favorite things about the university is Mm -hmm. that it's different than what I did for quite a while. Mm -hmm. For quite a while, when my kids were a certain age, um, I did a lot of travel. I did a lot of one and done uh, workshops, you Mm -hmm. know, where I just Mm -hmm. go, I do the thing, and then I leave. I I was super excited once I wrote the the Building Powerful Numeracy books, because then I could at least talk slower during that one and done. I could (laughs) leave the book. I didn't feel like I had to give everything I ever knew in that that one time. Um, You and I were writing together, and we were creating lessons and stuff, but I really loved it when I started teaching at the university. Because I began to be able to create longer relationships. Yeah. Um, or, you know, I had a whole semester and um, I could have students, um, uh, I could see their growth. And, and you know, we like we created a relationship. And I, I would have students walk me to my car at the end of class. And, uh, you know, it was just, we'd continue to talk math and teaching yeah. and everything. And so yeah. it's been really fun now to have that need also met in our journey group. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I don't mind, you know going to a conference, but I, I'm not, that's not really my jam as much. Uh, I don't love a one and done type thing. And I think maybe that's why I love coaching uh, because it's like a long-term relationship and I want to see what happens with these teachers and the coaches kind of implement change. And mm-hmm. I'm super invested in that. And I, you know, I love that you will go do national conferences and I get to <laughs> do, 
do stuff with our uh with journey and journey leaders it's just it's my favorite like uh, it's what i it's what i love yeah it's nice at one point you and i did a uh coaching gig together yeah there's a small independent school near us that wanted some professional learning and some coaching and so the you, the two of us um we co-presented together and then you coach some of the teachers and I coach, you coach most of them and I coach some of the teachers. And um, in that, it was interesting because part of what we did with that school was create, well, we really grappled with creating a shared vision. Yeah. And we kind of wish in hindsight that we'd had a resource that we're going to share today to help, yeah. to help co-create that. We'd wish that we'd had that. I think it would have been helpful. Um, yeah. So last week, Kim, in uh -huh. the podcast, we talked yeah. about um, a look for for students, for student mm -hmm. mathematics that mm -hmm. was created by New York City Public Schools, yeah. by a very thoughtful group of, of people. And they created more than just that look for, look, uh, how, I can't remember what it's called, look for for students. They also created two other documents, one of which we'd like to talk about today. Yeah. So, so, so we did yeah. student learning and mm -hmm. we talked about careful planning, um, and how it's really impactful. And even if it's just for one, one lesson on occasion, um, it can really help you create a habit of thinking and about important moves that you need to make. So today we're going to focus on the teacher version, um, and get a little deeper on that because the original first one that we talked about was really teachers thinking about their students. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. today is it's all about what about the students, what the stu design. To what, yeah, yep. what, to what extent students are doing things, to what extent students are doing things. Yeah. And and today is more about, did you say lesson design? Uh, yeah. It's about supporting conversations, maybe between coaches and teachers. Ah, nice. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely for teachers because right. it's supporting lesson design, but it could encourage a conversation between coaches and teachers. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Which, which could be, uh, sometimes feel like it's from the coaches to the teachers, but I do love a good teacher who pushes on their coach and says, Hey, this is what I, this is what I want and need. And here's how you can support me. Absolutely. Maybe I was that pushy teacher. It's not pushy. <laughs> it's, it's knowing what's helpful for you and advocating for yourself, Yeah, absolutely. which is super, super important. Yeah. So, um, often, uh, teachers will be interested in a model lesson. Um, mm -hmm. and they'll say like, Hey, if I could just see what that might look like, then I'll be able to, to do the thing that you're suggesting. And there might be some value in that. I mean, sometimes we, we just want to see, uh, it's easier to see than just like hear the words talk being talked about and like describe Absolutely. it. So uh -huh. there's some value in that, but how many times have people seen you do a problem string? They participate in a workshop or in a conference. And then when it comes time for them to turn around, they just balk because they're like, wait, that didn't go the way it went for you. Like, how did that happen? Um, I, I, I don't know how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And, and I think really it's because they weren't aware of the kind of background planning and the choices that you make and the teacher moves that you make. Mm -hmm. It just feels like, you know, a list of problems and, um, surely I can turn that around, but there's so much planning that goes into each of the, uh, the things that we do. And if you're not aware, then you go give it a try and you're like, oh, that did not, that did not happen. Like Pam did. Yeah. And when you say so much, I don't, I, so much planning, I, I don't want to give uh, listeners the false impression that if you don't have a year and a half to plan for next, the next problem string you do, then it's going to fail and, and be horrible. I mean, we do want you to dive in and try stuff. And uh -huh. I think maybe I would say, yes, yes, so much planning, but, but that there are a few important things that really can help things get better. And so one of the most important things that we do, like in our journey group is when we um, show a video of a problem string with real, real kids, not fake kids <laughs> that we then call out what made that go really well. We call out those few important things and we discuss those and we make sure that that's sort of evident. We have that as part of the, part of the experience isn't just watching part of the experience is the, making, uh, making those things visible. Yeah. The thing, I think the thing we're going to talk about today can help call those things out. Can yeah. help sort of say, these are some of the things that you want to be thinking about to help make lessons snap, to help them really have mathing happening, happening, not just memorizing and mimicking. And, and, I, and I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that because, um, 
never doing anything because you think you need to have it planned perfectly means nothing's going to ever happen. And so, you know, we learn by doing. And so if you say, oh, I, you know, I saw that problem string and I'm going to go dive in, I'm going to do it. And it didn't go the way that you anticipated that it would go, then you're questioning why. And you're, you're kind of trying to figure that out. And that is the learning opportunity. So if you just sit back and you don't do anything and, you know, you, you're in analysis paralysis, then mm -hmm. no, yeah, it's, that's not helpful either. Yeah. So teachers, we, I invite you to invest here today because this document that we're going to describe a little bit could help you plan and measure your current teaching up against a description of a possible. Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah, let's, let's do some of that. So if I can um, describe this document a little bit, it's called look fors for teacher practice in mathematics. And it has four sections. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Last week's look for was really built to be a conversation between a teacher and themselves. It was really about what can, what questions can you ask, ask yourself about what your students are doing? Mm. And this one is built to be a conversation between the teacher and the coach. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe a shoulder a conversation. partner if you, if you yeah. don't have a coach, but yeah, 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 yes. So those four sections are split up into one of them is uh, actually, let me read the first sentence. This classroom look for tool can support conversations about the lesson design, teacher practices, and classroom culture for mathematics. So there's kind of That's the setup, nice, nice yeah. setup. Then there's these four areas. One of them is tasks and problems. One of them is mathematical discourse. Third one is engage all students in productive struggle about mathematical ideas. And the last one is assessment and checking for student understanding. So the first thing I want to say is I appreciate the fact that the titles of those, they kind of used a buzzword and then kind of used not buzzwords, mm -hmm. which I thought was uh, helpful because they could have just for the last one said assessment, mm -hmm. but they mean, ch and checking for student understanding, because you could hear assessment and just think summative, you know, like the end of the course or the end of the unit or whatever, but they really want to talk about ch uh, checking for student understanding. Mm -hmm. um, another example is um, tasks and problems. I think sometimes we just say tasks. Sometimes we just say problems. Um, that, but, but let's let's talk about the stuff that's going on. You know, the kind of activities kids are doing. Um, anyway, so those are the kind of the four areas. In each of the areas, they have two columns. One column is indicators, and the other column are are questions that are conversation starters. Mm -hmm. So especially useful for a coach to say, hey, if I'm, I'm thinking about this particular category and I'm looking at these indicators, I could start the conversation about this with these conversation starting questions. Mm -hmm. To do that, um, we're going to kind of do what we did last week, which is Kim and I both chose a favorite. And we're instead of reading them all, we're going to kind of look at a favorite um, and then kind of share how it's sort of built in these indicators and conversation starters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, anything else, Kim, to overall before we talk about a favorite? No, uh, maybe I zoned out, but I, I, did you, did you, <laughs> sorry. Um, the conversation starters, I think, is really important. Uh, did you mention that? that I, like, mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by the idea of conversation starters because it's not a judgment and it's not um, it's not like, you know, pass or fail force for something on the teachers. It really is like, here's a good thing for you guys to have a conversation about to, to get a little deeper into what the indicator is. And coaches, we would highly recommend that it's a conversation. It's yes. not a, I'm shaming you with, by, you know, pointing out what you didn't, didn't do or did do or whatever. It's, it's, it, it, I think, um, thoughtful adults can have conversations to get at the root of what they believe and they think so that then it can transfer into their pro, uh, process, progress, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. pro, there's another, there's another word I want. Pra, pra, pra. Yeah. I don't know. Trans transfer into what they do. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think in general in life, like I'm, I, uh, like to listen a bunch and I, I, um, I can tell when I'm super excited about something because I find myself talking more than less. And, uh, you know, I really ask questions kind of in my life to hear what the other person's thinking, but I can tell in a conversation like this, I want to like, dump knowledge more mm. than I, you have, you have uh, a tendency to, I do, like, yeah. I do, I do, because I get excited when I'm having a conversation about something that I'm, you know, I, I feel like I have some things to share. And so, you know, maybe a, a coaching thing is if you're talking more and your teacher is talking less, uh, what can you do to, to, to flip that? 
um, mm. because maybe they're processing uh, while they're talking as well. Um, can I go first? Can I share one that I yep, go ahead. that I found? Okay, so under the assessment and checking for student understanding, that pings for me. Assessments tough. I, I think we assess a lot, but I don't think all assessment is bad. What I think we assess a lot is like a paper pencil sit quiet at your desk, like do the things like so analyze data. And there, there is room for a place something for like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the one I love is but maybe, it, maybe quit doing it. So, Oh, I mean, some of the, mm-hmm. some of the schools our kids have gone to assess too often. It's a too lot. Much. It's a lot. It's, yeah. But I, I think assessment is crucial. Assess in that way. Or I should have said assess in that way. In that way. Yeah. I think assessment is crucial and I think it should be often, but here's an assessment that I love. That's an indicator. In what ways does the teacher make in the moment decisions on how to respond to students with prompts that probe, scaffold, and extend? Like that is a true measure of a teacher assessing what's going on, assessing the conversation, assessing what students maybe know or don't know yet based on what they're hearing back from their kids. And this is like so, so important to me. Uh, I can remember being in uh, a second grade classroom. And I was kind of helping to facilitate a, a, a student investigation so that there could be a Congress the next day. And the teacher called me over and she was like, uh, like, I don't, <laughs> she's like, can you talk to them? And I knelt down next to the kids and I said something like, Hey, will you tell me what you're thinking? And she, she kind of stood back kind of eyeballing the class, but also listening, which I think is really sharp on her part. Cause it wasn't like, I'm going to just, you deal with them. I'm going to walk away. She was really a a student and a a learner. And so she called me over and I knelt down and I started talking to them and, you know, I kind of picked into what they were doing and like nudged them and, and, and off they went. And the first thing she said to me when I stood up was, I don't know how to make that happen. Like, how did you even know what to ask them? And I think it has everything to do with, you know, we talk about it over and over again, knowing your content so that when you have conversations with students, you can very much do this making in the moment decisions about how to respond, how to probe, how to scaffold, mm-hmm. how to extend mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because you know, the content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, which is kind of you, I hear you saying getting to know the kids yeah. you're there getting to know the kids. And, and then as you're getting to know them, you're making those moment to moment decisions because right. you know, your content, know your right. kids, know your content. Mm-hmm. Well, and it also, we talked about this in a podcast episode. I don't, I don't know which one, but we talked about knowing your beliefs. It was very early on. Talking about cementing in yourself and in your teaching what you believe to be true about the way that you teach and about what you think about kids, because it's not just like, do you know your mathematical content? Do you believe kids can? Do you believe that it's worth the time? All the things that you know to be true for you as a teacher, and that's not for us to decide for you, but do you, have you made those decisions and and solidified those beliefs so that you don't sway in the moment so that you don't go, ah, oh, I gotta, I gotta change this right now for this thing. So all of those in the moment decisions are based on your beliefs and about the content that you know. And I think that's worth having a conversation with, with people about like, can you make in the moment decisions? And then what changes did you make in your lesson today? And what prompted those changes is you one just, of the conversation starters. Yeah. You just stole the one I was going to share. Thanks oh, so. I'm sorry. There's that's so okay. Difference. So well, so let me add on to that. Um, okay. The conversation starter that so that you read an indicator. Uh-huh. Um, in what ways does the teacher make in the moment decisions on how to respond to students with prompts that probe, scaffold, and extend? Yeah. And in the other column are, are a couple conversation starters, one of which is what changes did you make in your lesson today? Yeah. What prompted these changes? Um, and what I thought about when I read those was the work of Deborah Ball at the University of Michigan recently, where she talks about discretionary spaces. Yeah. And that is it, it that the teacher has many discretionary spaces that are those in the moment decisions that you make. And I think that we add to that conversation is we need to have uh how do I say this? We need to work with others to ferret out and uncover what is our underlying philosophy about teaching and learning so mm-hmm. that then in those moment to moment decisions we make them based on that. If we, if we don't, like you were saying, if we don't know what we believe about teaching and learning, then we're probably going to make decisions based on our prior experience, the way that we were taught, Mm -hmm. because that's kind of all we have to to base it on. 
And so one of the things we're trying to do in this podcast and in our journey and in our online workshops and all the work that we do is help people um, clearly see what their perspective was so that then they can choose what perspective they want and then make changes based on that. So I think it's a brilliant conversation starter to say, what changes did you make in your lesson today? And what prompted those changes? That That's a way to say, how were you assessing? If you made a change, you were assessing. Something happened in your in your uh, formative assessment to say, ooh, I need to shift here. Yeah. And let's talk about that. Let's point it out. Let's um, uh, discuss, are you glad that you did that? Or mm-hmm. you know, because it was based on blank, uh, what, would you, what would you want to do in the future? I think it's a great question for all of us to be able to think about um, as, as we improve our craft. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. And, and changes, you know, might be uncomfortable from time to time, but they're not bad. Like, I think, I think if we're not making changes along the way, then we're not really uh, meeting the needs that arise as they come. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, we might have a plan and it might go pretty close to plan, but there will be some shucking and jiving that has to happen along the way. Um, and you might have the same outcome that you hope to have, but, but because you adapted to mm-hmm. the students as you went, you were able to focus the lesson in the way that it could go. Not that it doesn't matter what kids were doing. This is the worksheet at the end of the day. And I'm going to pull, I can pull out my entire quarter of worksheets that, you know, like we can print them off. Here they are. They're in this folder. Uh, that's, that's not what we would call responsive teaching. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to mention one more because uh, I, I still think that there's a uh, time in the year to address this. Back in uh, January in the teacher Facebook group, which people should be in. Why are you not in the oh, Facebook yeah, join group, our, people? Join, join the Facebook our te- group. Yeah, the Math is Figure Outable teacher Facebook groups. Great place. Yeah. Uh, lots of good stuff going on. Yeah. So uh, the question right below the one that you that I stole from you, and I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> it says, what might we try... To, re- to surface student thinking, especially the thinking of students whose ideas we don't know much about yet. And so in January, I shared a prompt in that group that that is a time for me to say, like, who do I not know enough about yet? And I literally would sit down at, at mid, mid semester or whatever for us and make a, make a list of who do I not know enough about yet personally, uh, about their jer- mathematical journey. And I would keep that, that index card or post-it note in my desk so that when I opened it, I had a desk <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, and I would pull it open and, and I would see names, like specific names of kids that I would say, I don't know enough about them yet. Um, and, it, and you know, sometimes the list was longer than maybe it should have been, but it was a reminder to me. So if even, even at this time of the year, if there are kids who's thinking you don't know much about yet, it's not too late to make that be a goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Nice. All right. My turn. I'm going to share okay. one. Okay. So one of the things I really liked uh, was in the the section, engage all students in productive struggle about mathematical ideas. Uh-huh. And it's, it's a conversation starter. So it's in the right column. And it said, when students struggle, what do, or what could you do? So what do you do or what could you do to maintain students opportunities to develop their own mm. ideas and understandings? Yeah. I thought that was a, a nice way. Um, we've worked with a lot of teachers who, and I understand this. If you've if you've never experienced real math teaching, like teaching real math, getting kids to really math, um, you could hear productive struggle as sort of your job is to kind of be a cheerleader. You know, mm-hmm. like keep going, you can do it. Nope, not right yet. Guess again. Mm-hmm. Um, versus w- when students are struggling, what do you do or what could you do? And then this is so important, not to get them to get the answer right, not so that you can move on and they're satisfied, but what can you do to maintain students' opportunities to develop? I really like that. Develop is so important. If we're yeah. developing, we're growing and learning and becoming, we're, we're gaining capacity. We're getting stronger. All of those things are different than memorize the procedure differently or, you know, get the step right or, or whatever. It's, it's, it's. And, and I, I, I've been guilty of it that in that moment to moment decision-making when students are struggling, teachers are struggling in PD where I've had the inclination to go, yes, <laughs> you know, just to answer their question, no, you know, or five, or whatever, instead of maintaining the opportunities for them to develop. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's trivial. It's so not trivial. I think, boy, we could, as a, as a, a, a professional group of learners, we could really help each other out there. 
I think it matches what you say at the intro that um, we're mentoring students. And, mm. and I think it matches really well that we're mentoring students and teachers so that they can develop. It's cool. kind of our role. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So much of this discussion is about creating a shared vision. When we hand you these documents, this is a shared vision that uh, leaders in New York City public schools have created. Um, we've also done some work, Kim and I, when we create this podcast, we've created a shared vision about what this podcast has done. We have a, a continual implementation support group called Journey. In that, we've created a shared vision of what it looks like to be successful on that journey. Mm -hmm. We call it a success map. Shared visions are so helpful and important. If you can find, y'all, if you can't find one we mentioned earlier, join our teacher Facebook group. If you can, join our journey group where we are like-minded teachers and leaders working together, helping each other build a shared vision. So helpful and important. Yeah. Hey, where can people find uh, this this teacher one? Yeah. So again, crazy link. We're going to put the link in the show notes. Um, okay. So go, if you've never gone to show notes before, just get into wherever you listen to podcast and look down. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll have a paragraph about the, the, um, the particular episode and then there'll be a link in there where you click on that link and you can download it. Um, and while you're downloading, leave us a note. <laughs> oh yeah. And then give us a rating, give us a rating, give us a, give us a review. That'd be fantastic. We'll probably also put a blog out somewhere around this time. that will have all the links in there too. If yep. you haven't checked out blogs yet, uh, we, yeah, check out our blogs. Um, and y'all, thank you for tuning in and teaching more and more real math. To find out more about the Math is Figure Outable movement, visit mathisfigureoutable.com. And thank you for spreading the word that math is figure outable. Thank you for listening and making math more figure outable. To learn even more, make sure you register for our free challenge at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. You are not going to want to miss the evenings of May 15th through 17th, starting at 7 p.m. Central. Math teaching, math teaching, go register now. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Join us to make math more and more figure outable. And if you can't join live, register and we'll send you access to the recordings. We'll see you there.